Well, if you will, open your Bibles to Psalm 119 and verse 160. And that will be a basis for our message today. Psalm 119, verse 60. While you're turning to that, I want to thank our students. Yesterday they had a, a day for whiz kids over at the Rock House, and our students were involved in that and did a great work. Kent told me they were excellent in helping over there, so we appreciate their ministry to these uh, boys and girls from Crutcho. Well, we talked last week. We had a lot of people that were gone because of the uh, marathon, and we talked and started this message about declaring God's Word. It's in our purpose statement. This is why we exist. And I've given it at the beginning of this outline, and please don't panic when you see that outline. I'll get through this message quickly, so just don't worry about it. But I wanted to put in there what we talked about last week so that you could be brought up to speed. And we did stress the fact, declaring God's Word, that's not just my responsibility or Sunday school teacher's responsibility. It's these uh, community groups that we have. But it is every believer's responsibility to share God's Word. And we talked about why the Word of God should be central in our lives. And we stressed just the fact that it's God's message to us. It's His teaching to us, His personal message to you and to me. And then the power that it has. You see that in the enduring nature of the Word of God. You see it also. It will accomplish every single purpose that God has for it. The Bible says that. And then the impact. When you understand the impact that the Word of God can have upon a person's life that's going to read it and study it. Well, that's what we want to start talking about today. And uh, I want to begin just with this, that the Bible does this. It stresses this. It reveals God's truth about so many different issues of life. Now, I know I referred to this briefly last week. I want to go more in depth about this. When it talks about truth, God's truth, I want you to know, first of all, this is absolute truth. It is absolute. That means it's unchanging. Many in our society and world today, they want to advocate that truth is relative, that there's no such thing as absolute truth. And that's just completely incorrect. Uh, some of these people want to say, listen, truth is whatever you want it to be. Now, they only apply this to certain areas of life. They'll apply it in a moral area of life, to ethical areas. But it's just whatever you want it to be. What's truth for me may not be truth for you. What's truth for you may not be truth for me. That's what they'll say. And they're completely incorrect when they say that. If they adopt that way of thinking, they're distorting what God says in His Word. Truth as presented by God in the Bible is unalterable. It's unchanging. It's going to be the same through all the generations of time. No matter what man's out here saying. Man can deny this. He can argue against this. He can completely reject this. And a human being will be wrong if they do those things. God's Word stays the same. His truth stays the same. And that's why declaring God's Word is so extremely important because it reveals what God says is true about so many issues of life that are vital to our well-being. It gives understanding to us. Now, the Bible says in John chapter 1, it talks about the people, how they were in darkness spiritually. And that's a hard truth to communicate to individuals. Uh, People out here can say, listen, I know a whole lot more than you do about computers or about science or about medicine or about business. So don't tell me I'm in darkness. Well, you can be a genius in those areas and be in darkness spiritually. Not have a grasp on spiritual truth. And be enlightened spiritually. But the Bible can bring that enlightenment to a person's life. It gives us understanding if we'll just look to it. Understanding about God. Listen, what about God? What about God? Years ago, there was a movie that was entitled, What About Bob? And people always rag on me about that. Listen, what about God? What do you know about God? Well, the Bible says God is love. It's already been underscored here in songs we've sung and the prayers that have been prayed. And you can say, well, yeah, I know God's love. Well, really, do you know the depth of His love? Do you know that you can be living in sin that is grotesque to Him, deeply disappointing to Him, and He still loves you? Do you know you can say to Him, I don't even believe in you, I don't think you exist? Or you can curse His name? And he detests the sin, but he still loves you. The vilest sinner, he loves you. 
And that is just, that's beyond our comprehension, the kind of love that God has. But the Bible says, 1 John 4, 16, just these three words, God is love. God is love. And then he's this, he is extremely patient. They just sung about the return of Christ to the earth, and Peter, Peter preached about the return of Christ. And he was telling the people that the Lord's going to come, and he really wanted to stress that because there were individuals in his day that were saying, well, where, where is the promise of his coming? I mean, we haven't seen him. He hasn't shown up yet. And Peter explains this in Second Peter chapter 3. And he says this in verse 8, uh, Do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. He said, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient. He is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. He is just remarkably patient in his dealings with us. And then the Bible talks about this great forgiveness that God has. You're in Psalm 119. Look over here in Psalm 103. These are some of the greatest verses in the Bible about forgiveness. In verse 10 and following of Psalm 103, it says this, He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Thank God he hasn't nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Why, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins from us. I mean, do you really know that in your heart? He's taken away all your sins if you've trusted in Christ completely, forgiven you of all your past, your present, and future sins you'll commit completely. The slate's wiped clean. But now there's another truth about God. We like to hear that statement, but still here in Psalm 103. I want you to look at a comment that's made here in verse 9. It says this. God who is loving, unconditional, profound love. God who is patient. God who will forgive. It also says this. He will not always strive with man. Verse 9. He will not always strive with man, nor will he keep his anger forever. If somebody says, I don't ever have to worry about it, God will always. It'll be all right between God and me. And continue to live their own life, live in their own ways, not come to God on his terms and think it's going to be all right. That verse right there is very important. God will not always strive with man. He's not going to contain his anger forever, his anger against sin. And then the Bible tells us this about God. It underscores there's just one God. You know, when you think of planet Earth, there are about 7.5 billion people on planet Earth. When you think of the universal order, there are billions of stars. So many things are in great numbers. When you think about God, there's one God. There's not two, there's not three, there's one God. He's revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but one God. Deuteronomy 6, in verse 4, stresses this, The Lord our God is one. Isaiah 45, verse 18, underscores the very same thing as do many other verses in the Bible. Jesus, when he taught his disciples to pray, he didn't say, listen, there is a multiplicity of gods you can talk to. He said, look, when you want to pray, you say, our Father, singular, our Father who art in heaven, one. And then the Bible talks about his power and his knowledge and his presence. But all powerful. Years ago when I was in college at the heart of Texas Coliseum in Waco, they had a crusade, and a guy by the name of Paul Anderson came. He was the strongest man in the world at that time. He gave his testimony for Christ, and then he did something I've yet to see any other human being do. He took 250 pounds in one hand, put it up just like this, and stuck it straight up in the air. 250 pounds, strongest man in the world. Well, he's dead. He's a follower of Christ. He's already in heaven. He's strong compared to you and I. We, we can't relate to the strength of the eternal God that keeps the universal order intact every single moment of every single day, all-powerful. Sometimes people wander through life, and even believers think, well, I've got this problem. I just don't know if God can handle this. Are you kidding? All-powerful. He's all-knowing. 
that he knows every single thought that you have in your mind right now. He knows about all the thoughts we've had in the past. He knows what's going to, we'll be thinking about in the future. He knows what we'll be doing. His knowledge is just, it's incomprehensible. And his presence, he's all present. You and I are present right here. We're not present anywhere else. God is here right now when we leave. I don't care where you go, he's there. He's the only one you can say that about. And then the Bible says this, when it talks about kingdoms, there's only one kingdom. All this striving in the world today, and listen, we want to do the best we can for our nation. We hope other nations will prosper and be blessed. But all these kingdoms are temporary. The Bible says one kingdom is eternal. Daniel chapter 2, there's that vision that King Nebuchadnezzar had about these kingdoms. And then it says there's a small stone that it strikes this, this image. And that small stone is not made without, it's made without human hands, and it's the kingdom of God. And it says all these other kingdoms are done away with, but this kingdom is going to endure forever. That's God. And then it underscores when it talks about God, there's one Savior, and it's Him. He's presented Himself in Jesus Christ. And He's the only Savior. All these things the Bible says about God. And you think people know all about this. I promise you they don't. And I don't even know how many of us think about this aspect of God, he's all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present. Because some, you know, the Bible talks about people, how they go sleek around at night in darkness and sin and think, nobody sees me. I can get away with it. God's right there. They think they can get into a room, a private room, turn on a computer. Nobody sees me. God's right there. He's everywhere. But all those things about God, what about man? The Bible says to us about man. Mankind doesn't really understand himself that much, I don't think. Man is fine. I, some of these people, when they're young, think they're, well, I'm invincible. Well, nobody's invincible. Man's finite. The Bible says life's like a vapor here momentarily, then vanisheth away. So life in this world is temporary, but then the Bible also says about a human being, once we're conceived, then we're going to live forever. Every single person is going to live forever. Whether they're a believer or whether they're not a believer, they live forever. Not in this world, but they do live forever. And then the Bible says this about all mankind, that man is just sinful. He is sinful. And we don't like to hear that sometimes because we think, well, that's just not flattering to us. So that's kind of discouraging. Well, the Bible is just telling us the truth. In Romans chapter 3, it says... It says this, what then, are, are we better than they? This is verse 9. Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks, all people are under sin. It is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. We have all sinned. Romans 3.23 sums it up very briefly and just a very short statement, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's true for every human being. People live with the notion, here's the philosophy of the world today, man's basically good. I don't know how many times I've heard people say that. Listen, I just believe man is basically good. In his heart, all people are basically good. Well, that's not what the Bible says. I'm basically sinful and so are you. If we're left to ourselves, our lives will come undone. We'll sin. Now, the Bible tells us this man is capable of doing good, and you don't have to be a Christian to do good. There can be somebody who is lost that doesn't know Christ, and they can do some charitable works. They can do some good deeds. The Bible says in Acts chapter 10, it tells about a man named Cornelius, and this man, Cornelius, was a religious man, but he was not a saved man. And here's what it says about him. In Acts chapter 10, verse 1, it says there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. He was a devout man. He was one who feared God. He's religious, but he didn't know God. You think that's impossible. If you fear him, you've got to know him. No, you don't. It says he feared God. And it says in all his household, and he gave many alms to the Jewish people, and he prayed he prayed to God, continue to say, this guy's got to be saved. He was not saved. 
Simon Peter, who was sent by the Lord to speak to him, and it says in Acts chapter 10, after he heard Peter preach about Christ, then he gave his life to Jesus Christ. But here was a guy, and there was some goodness in his life even when he was lost, so man can do some things that are good. But here's one other thing about mankind. There's not one human being that has any capability, in the least, of saving themselves. They can't. Now, there's an old hymn that says, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Which means you have nothing, you don't have anything you can offer to God that would make up for the sin that you've committed in your life, nor do I. But that's what the Bible, it talks to us about man. It says, here's the condition of man. And then what about life in the world? How do you live life in the world effectively? Well, the Bible tells us that also. And what it says is not what you would anticipate because here's what should be primary in any person's life. And it doesn't matter whether you're in ministry or whether you're in medicine or whether you're in the teaching profession. If you're in a business where you, you have responsibility of cleaning up, like cl helping the streets be clean, or you pick up trash, which, thank God, there are people who do that. How horrible society would be if we didn't have people like that. If you're a plumber, if you're an electrician, if you work at Tinker, whatever, if you're a housewife, whatever, you want to have a successful life, here's what the Bible says first and foremost. You need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. That should be priority number one. And so many people, they're so far from that, they don't understand that. But you want a successful life. You want to be successful in your relationships. It's all about that. I'm going to love God supremely, and I'm going to love my neighbor as myself. I'm going to love in the way that the Lord directs me to love. That's the way for a successful life. Certainly, you want to apply yourself. The Bible tells us to do that. And what are our chosen field of profession or whether we're in school? We want to be the best we can be, do the best you can do. But you better have that sense of love and worship in your heart for God and love your fellow man for success in life. I'm just telling you, most people don't think of it like that. And then what about eternity? And people do wonder about that. And the Bible gives the clear truth about it. How does someone have eternal life? You think, well, anybody knows the answer to that. No, they don't. The rich young ruler, I'm thinking this young man must be pretty sharp financially. He's rich. He must know how to work with people. He's a ruler over people. So he had the answer to a lot of things, but here's what he didn't have the answer to. He didn't have any earthly idea about how to have eternal life. How can I get to heaven? And so he comes to the Lord Jesus and asks him that very question. What must I do to have eternal life? The Bible is the only place you can go to find the answer to that question. It explains it in Christ. But then what about this question? Is there an eternal hell? And the Bible certainly makes that abundantly clear as well. And Jesus Christ, when he gave these various parables and teachings, in fact, and don't, please don't think Jesus is some person who's just extremely negative. Well, he's certainly not. He's the most positive person around. But Jesus dealt in reality. He spoke more about eternal hell than he did about eternal heaven because he knew those people were going there, and he's trying to warn them. And in Matthew in chapter 25, when he's telling one of these parables, he tells about the judgment in the last verse in Matthew 25, verse 46, Jesus said this. He said, these will go away into eternal punishment. Eternal. It's not temporary punishment. It is eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So Christ underscores yes. All that's there. Well, now you would think, you would think a human being... Uh, given to themselves, they just think, they'd be able to figure some of this out themselves, but they cannot. Listen, there's scores of people, millions of people who believe there are many gods. They believe there are many gods. Hindus believe there are millions of gods. In Acts chapter 17, when Paul was at Athens and he saw all these statues out here to all these gods that didn't even exist, they even created a statue to an unknown God just to make sure they'd covered all the bases. And Paul stood before them and said, listen, I want to tell you the truth. Let me tell you about the one true God. But there, there are people that believe there are many gods. There are some people who think there, there are no gods. 
Some human beings, they make their own gods and worship those gods. There, there are people who think we're all going to heaven. Mormons believe everybody gets to go to heaven. There are people who feel that way. God, God, this loving God that you've told me about, there's no way he's going to let anyone go to an eternal hell. We all get to go to heaven. So they think. Others think there's no afterlife. On one of the films we showed around here in a focus class, there was a professor they interviewed, and this guy was an atheist, and he was just ridiculing the thought of life after death. He said, there's no such thing. He said, that's a joke. He said, when you die, you're dead. And that's the philosophy of a lot of people, that you're born, if you get to grow up, you work, you maybe have a family, you live, and then you die. And that's it. Well, that's not what the Bible says. That's not it in the least. I mean, what man thinks, and then what they feel about life, how your success in life, so many people measure success in monetary terms or in pleasure. It's all about pleasure. It's about me enjoying myself. Do you know, nowhere in the Bible does it say, here's the ultimate goal in life for you that Jesus Christ has for you. He just wants you to have pleasure. It doesn't ever say that. And yet people live with that philosophy. I was driving, this was in Midwest City here, I was driving this some time back, and this guy came by me, had a very expensive automobile. It was a Corvette. It's very expensive. Nothing wrong. People want to own those things. That's fine. But this guy, here's the bumper sticker he had on the back of his uh, Corvette. The one with the most toys wins. And I thought, buddy, you've got to be pretty arrogant. Driving a car like that, and you're going to stick that in the face of all the people, the one with the most toys wins, like you're better than all the rest of us? And I thought to myself, I'd love for you to get to go have a conversation with a guy in Luke 16 that Jesus told about who was a rich man who lived in the lap of luxury all his life, but then he died. And he didn't know God, and he's in torment. I said, I, I thought to myself, I'd love for you to get to go visit with that guy and run that by him and see if he agrees with that philosophy. The one with the most toys wins. How foolish. Man's so confused. You know, there's a statement. I want you to turn it. I found this verse. I've read Isaiah many times, but this week it just leaped out at me. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28. And look in, in verse 15. And the Lord's making a statement to these people. In verse 14, he says, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, O scoffers. You scoffers, you listen to the word of the Lord. And he says this, You scoffers who rule this people who are in Jerusalem, because you have said, We've made a covenant with death, and with Sheol we have made a pact. The overwhelming scourge will not reach us when it passes by. For we have made falsehood our refuge, and we have concealed ourselves with deception. We've made falsehood our refuge, and we've sealed ourselves in deception. And I just think that just characterized so many people, all these people going around, well, there's no hell. And my ultimate goal in life is just to have pleasure. And God won't do anything to me. What are they doing? They're just concealing themselves in deception. And they're making themselves th think everything's all right when everything's not all right. And that's why the teaching of the Bible is so crucial. It's so vitally important because it reveals truth. Thy word is truth. God says, you want to know truth about me, about you, about life, about eternity, about how to live life successfully, about how to have meaningful relationships. Well, that truth's in my word. Thy word is truth. Listen, do you remember what Jesus said in John 16 when he talked about, he told his disciples, I'm going to go away and you can't come where I'm going. But he said, it's, it's going to be to your advantage because when I go, then I'm going to send the comfort of the Holy Spirit. My spirit will live within you. And he said, where the world is concerned, he said, here's what the Spirit's going to do. He said, it will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. But here's what he said to the believer, to his disciples. He said, when the Holy Spirit comes, here's one of his primary works in your life. 
He will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into truth. Because it's that important, it's that paramount in the life of a believer that we know the truth about what God says about himself and us and life. And he says, the Spirit of God, that's why he's here, to guide you in truth. And listen, that doesn't mean this. That doesn't mean that, okay, I've got the Spirit of God in me, and he's just going to put it in my mind, and I don't ever have to look at the Word of God. That's not it. It's the Holy Spirit taking the Word of God and using that Word to work in your heart and in your mind and in your spirit to enlighten you and to give understanding to you about what truth is. But you will never know it if you ignore this book. Thy Word is truth. Well, listen, I closed the message last week in the same way, and I'm going to do it again this week. I don't know how many of you did this, but I know some of you did it because I've had calls this week. And one lady in particular called me, and she said, you know what, I've heard people say to me before I ought to read the Bible, but she said, somehow last week when you were speaking, it just, it stuck. And she calls, wanted to talk to me about how I start reading this as I should. And uh, if you have not been reading the Bible, I want to encourage you to do this. I challenge you to do this. I just want you to do one chapter. You just take one chapter. If you haven't been reading the Bible, start in the Gospel of John. And don't speed read it. I don't care if you're the fastest reader in here. Don't read the Bible like that. You read it prayerfully. Read it slowly. And ask God, Lord, with your spirit, speak to my heart. Reveal something to me. That little thought that I just shared with you from Isaiah... I'd never seen that before. In all these years of preaching, I'd never stood out to me before until this week. So you just ask God. He can show you the unsearchable riches of God. Ask Him to show you truth and insight. If you're a child, if you can read, I encourage you boys and girls to do it. Get with your mom and dad. Teenagers do this. If you've been reading the Bible, good. God bless you. Keep doing it. And sometimes you can read the Bible and not get any charge out of it. I don't get a charge every time I read it. But keep reading it. You're going to see in other messages. This is one of the most important, vital things that we do in our lives. I can, I'll promise you this. If every believer in this church made this commitment that, Lord, I'm going to be devoted to your word. I'm going to read it, but not just read it. Lord, what you show me in your word, I'm going to pray and ask you to give me the strength to live by what you say. Not just that I know truth, but I live by truth. If we did that, I'll promise you this church would be revolutionized. It would become alive spiritually more than it ever has in the past. The Word of God is that powerful. Well, let's bow for a word of prayer, please. Father, I just can't say enough important things about your Word. It's a treasure. And Lord, we can read other books and we can sit in front of computers. We can watch TV and tell ourselves we don't have time to read the Bible. Father, I just pray you impress upon everyone here that we have time to do exactly what we want to do. And Father, I pray this becomes priority within our lives. Lord, we don't need to wander around out here being disillusioned in life or uh, being deceived in life. Father, thank you. You can bring clarity of thought to us. So I pray, I pray for myself and for every believer in this room that we'll take to heart this challenge. Lord Jesus, this week, every day this week, that we're going to take time to read your word and to pray and to ask you to speak to us. And Father, I just thank you for the chance to be in here this morning. And maybe there are people in here that are completely unfamiliar with your word or even you. And yet they've heard some of these basic teachings about how you love them. You love them to the point that you gave yourself to die on a cross so that they could be forgiven and have peace and have a relationship with you. And Lord Jesus, if there are the people in here that may not know you as Savior, I pray that your spirit, as only you can, would work within their hearts and bring conviction. But Lord, let them know you love them. And Lord, I just pray you'd draw them. I pray they'd receive you as their Savior. And, Father, for those that need to make that commitment today, help them to do that. And, Lord, I ask this in your name.